So uh, tonight's talk, uh, this is our sort of big ideas. We had Ken Van Tilburg and Anna Kesselman do this earlier. These are from our postdoctoral scholars. Right now we have 17 postdoctoral scholars at the Institute. These are individuals who are at a career stage between having gotten their PhD and whatever their next adventure uh, they choose. Some end up uh, as faculty, some choose to go off to industry, and some choose to go off to finance. And so uh, we asked them to share with all of us their big ideas, and I'm going to now hand it over to Mark for the introduction of NOAA. So thanks for coming, everybody, and thanks for your continued support. Over to you, Mark. Good evening, everybody. So the way this is going to run is Noah's going to give around a 15-minute talk on a big idea in, in his field of research. Uh, we will be recording the talk, but it's going to be a short um, embargo on the public availability of the talk because, like everything we do here, there's some hot new unpublished research, even in what Noah's going to tell you today, so he wants to have that sort of uh, submitted for publication before we make that part of the talk public. Most of the, uh, so after the talk, we'll have question and answer session, and you can either use the chat to use the raise hand capability, or you can just unmute yourself and say, I'd like to ask a question. And that may happen also during the, the short talk. Uh, don't be afraid to do that. The, the question and answer part will not be recorded, so you're free to say anything, ask anything you like. It won't go down in perpetuity. Noah, who's um, going to talk to us tonight in this series, that, as Lars said, I've asked, we've asked postdocs to do something's pretty challenging. It's going to be, it has to be short and broad. <laughs> that is really tough to meet, but that's the idea. And Noah uh, is a KITP postdoc. He's here on a fellowship, actually. Well, he's had two fellowships, but he came here December 2018. His MS and PhD is from University of Chicago, which is actually I think, pretty sure where I first met him because he was working in the group of William Irvin, who was a um, good friend and collaborator. But anyway, I met Noah and I gave a talk there. And he's done a lot of great work during his PhD and he's continuing that in, in, a, in a different direction here, which is always um, challenging. So I will turn it over to Noah. Thank you, Mark. Challenging and fun, I shall add. Um, Goes without saying. <laughs> so in this uh, Big Ideas talk, I'll tell you today a little bit about how biology uses physics to sculpt complex forms in living tissues. So that's a bit to unpack. So as a concrete example, what you see on this slide is an example of a, a developing organ in here in a few snapshots that is developing deep inside a living embryo. So these tissues are, are sculpted during development uh, into specific forms. And as a physicist, I find this incredibly intriguing. A, a clump of matter self-organizes to accomplish dramatic changes of form. And I want to know how we can understand the process of shape change so that's what I'll ask tonight. And I'll also ask, what does it have to do with physics? So to answer these questions, let's first zoom way out. And think very broadly for a moment, just about the landscape of science. So for instance, we could write a list of disciplines and arrange them loosely in order of scale with the the smallest scales of fundamental physics and atomic interactions at the very bottom, scale of chemistry in between, and at the top, let's place the scale of, of biological organisms like you and I or, or smaller invertebrates. So each level of this hierarchy clearly obeys the laws of the level below. 
like morphogenesis of tissues obeys the laws of cell biology, which obey the laws of chemistry, which obey the laws of atomic physics. However, we would be wrong to say that one level is merely an applied form of the field below. Because at each scale, there are new emergent phenomena that arise. And these allow for a different kind of description, uh, a description which will often use different vocabulary and a different flavor of, of mathematical equations than the level below. In other words, you could say that, as Bill Anderson put, more is different, Me meaning more atoms gives rise to new and different phenomena, more cells give rise to new and different phenomena. So let's consider a concrete example before diving into morphogenesis specifically. A glass of water is composed of many, many molecules. Uh, but it would be wrong to say that the laws of fluid dynamics can be simply read off from those of atomic physics. So to com for instance, to compute the behavior of water flowing out from a cup, like in this picture, from fundamental interactions of quantum mechanical constituents could take an incredibly long time, perhaps longer than the age of the universe to simulate on a computer. And more importantly, it would completely miss the emergent simplicity of fluid behavior. There are, there are far fewer equations that are needed to capture the flow of a fluid than to capture all of the microscopic interactions of the constituents. And you might well say, like, well, it's just a rough approximation used to simplify the analysis. But I would argue that, no, the emergent equations actually give us more information than the atomic level description, or more useful information. What do I mean by that? Well, the flow of water is captured by the same equations as the flow, for instance, of oil or lava or mercury. All of these things are very, very different at the microscopic scale, at the atomic level. But from this fluid perspective, we can encapsulate a wide range of systems under a single structure. And I think importantly here, we did not derive fluid dynamics from bottom-up principles from atomic physics, but we took a top-down view. So with that, let's land on our target, which is the study of morphogenesis. So here is a video uh, of an organ, the same organ that we saw before. This is the gut of a fly. And I've imaged this on a fancy microscope here at, in Santa Barbara. And each blob here is part of a cell. This tissue you can see is dramatically changing its shape over the course of this two hour movie. So we can ask in settings like this with living tissues changing their form, could there be simple top down principles to be discovered that might in some way be analogous to our fluid dynamics uh, simplicity that emerged? And in order to think clearly about this, we must first ask a simpler question, which is, how is it that we even define physical form? What does that mean? And we wouldn't be the first ones to ask, ask this question. Um, in fact, already a century ago, there was a zoologist named Darcy Thompson who had this fairly revolutionary vision of how to understand biological forms. Uh, Thompson looked to physics and to mathematics, not merely to describe, but also to explain how physical phenomena might determine biological structures. So he writes in this book from 1917, cell and tissue, shell and bone, leaf and flower are so many portions of matter, their problems are form in the first instance, sorry, problems of form are in the first instance mathematical problems. Their problems of growth are essentially physical problems. And the morphologist, that is the person studying morphogenesis, is ipso facto a student of physical science. So while some of Darcy Thompson's particular ideas turned out to be technically flawed, the spirit of his vision strikingly mirrors how we physicists now approach such problems a century later. 
And in particular, I'll highlight here that he uses maps to understand the relation of forms between different species. And, and also the, the forms that arise during the growth and development of individual animals. He studies how, how physics constrains these maps uh, of tissue form during development. So Darcy Thompson was writing all this a long time ago. He didn't have all the tools we have today. And I want to highlight uh, one case study of, of the, the types of tools that have come about, which can kind of inform and contextualize our work. So in the intervening years, we've uncovered powerful insights, for instance, from genetics. Um, here, I'll show you the, the fruit fly at a very, very early stage. What you see, this, this initially featureless ellipsoid is the, the egg now with a bunch of cells. Um, of the fruit fly, and you can see that it becomes patterned in its form. One way to understand this patterning is by looking at the patterning of the genes that are expressed in this tissue. So decades of work here and a couple Nobel Prizes thrown in the mix have revealed uh, a hierarchical picture for how this process works in the fly and which transfers over to other animals as well. It's a kind of genetic cascade where simple patterns in concentrations of various proteins lead to finer and finer patterns that are uh, specifying the fate of different parts of the embryo with finer and finer resolution. So it's these, these stripes of gene activity that you see in these pictures, and the names are not so important to us, the stripes of gene activity regulate the behaviors within cells. So they act a bit like uh, a conductor of a, a protein synthesizing symphony. So we have this molecular description of, of increasing differentiation and patterning in tissues, but how does the tissue actually use this information to move and flow like you see in the video? This is kind of the nature of the interplay between biology and physics in this field. Whereas the biologist sees here an, an empty canvas for, for gene expression patterning, the physicist sees this tissue flows like a fluid. And it's not an ordinary fluid, however. It's not like your glass of water, because here the fluid, that is the tissue, is generating its own stresses. It's, it has tiny molecular motors that, that assemble into filaments, and these filaments tug on each other in order to create forces that pull and, and, and swish the tissue around into this swirling motion. Astoundingly, just the information encoded in the distribution of these molecular motors has been shown very recently to be sufficient to quantitatively predict the flow of the tissue during this stage. And this is done in the fly. A very similar study found uh, that was just published earlier this year found that the same principles apply in the bird embryo, which looks like a, a bit like a pancake uh, as it spreads out and, and also has this swirling uh, fluid-like motion. So here, uh, these, these flows also are captured in a prediction that describes the tissue as a fluid with patterned active forces arising from molecular motors. So to zoom out, we see that living tissues generate different kinds of information in order to change their form. There is genetic information encoded in the DNA and the expression of, of, of genes. And these form fields, what we could call as physicists scalar fields, the amounts of these proteins that exist at different places in space. These fields can provide instructions for cell behaviors like forming vectors, like uh, flow 
and velocity or, or an orientation of the cell in space. On the other hand, the tissue could also form structures like these orange bands in my cartoon where uh, you could have contractile cables in the tissue, which would form what we would call a tensorial field. The tissue contracts by different amounts in different directions. All of these forms of information can interact now in, in the biological systems, in living tissues, to generate shape change uh, of that living tissue. So we've, we've seen how this uh, can play out in two-dimensional tissue sheets, how they can swirl from their own internal activity. The question that I'm thinking about now is how 2D sheets of cells can transform into 3D. So there's a common motif in biology by which cells can arrange into tubes, sheets, a sheet arranged into a tube, which can further evolve into more complex forms, like, like a coil of compartments. And this is the motif that you see here in this video, where an initially tube-like structure of, of cells uh, further evolves into a coil with compartments. And this is also true in, in other internal organs. For instance, your heart starts off as a tube and transforms into a coil of compartments. So how do we understand this? Well, what I'll show you is that we can use this insight from Darcy Thompson from, from a century ago. Uh, we can use this vision of, of making maps and using uh, map making of the tissue in order to understand the ways that this tissue is flowing and deforming and understand how physics can constrain that motion. What do I mean? I'll show you an example. So we can take these 3D data and from, from our fancy microscope. We can use machine learning to automatically extract the shape of this organ, this gut. And then we can track the evolution of these shapes over time. So this allows us to get full three-dimensional uh, structure of the organ as it, as it develops inside a living embryo. And this allows us to selectively image specific layers of the tissue during this development. We can map those, that tissue to two dimensions using these maps. And that allows us to measure the flows of the tissue with great accuracy. So here, the colors that you see represent the, uh, the direction of the tissue flow locally, and the size of the arrows or the opacity of the color uh, shows just how strong that flow is. So by relating two-dimensional uh, flows to this th three-dimensional counterparts, we can start to make sense of what's going on physically in a developing organ like this. So for instance, this procedure enables, enables us to probe how the contractile patterns, shown here in blue in the middle, can drive this tube to fold. And as these folds deepen, swirling patterns arise that are reminiscent of what we saw before in, in other animals and in other stages of development uh, of the fly. We can then even predict the motion in three dimensions. We can predict how this tube will bend from just from the knowledge of the contractile patterns in, in two dimensions within the sheet of the cells. So I hope that this gives you a flavor for the, the top-down approach that we take and the kind of analysis that we use to understand changes in form in this living tissue. Sorry, did that just build? There we go. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think I missed the build there. So uh, here's this prediction on the bottom right. So zooming back out, we've asked this question, how do tissues change their form? And what, I've hope I've, what I hope I've shown you is that uh, the community 
can now build models of tissue morphogenesis from the top down using insights from physics. And what we're working on now at the KITP and at, at UCSB is extending this understanding to three dimensions, to three-dimensional shape changes. I think one big problem, one, one challenge for the community looking forward into the future is to integrate these top-down physical models with the sort of bottom-up biological information patterning uh, descriptions and understand how these two, two approaches weave together. So I want to thank uh, KNTP and also my wonderful uh, faculty mentors, uh, in particular uh, Zvonimir Dodzik in the Department of Physics, Boris Strayman in the KITP in the Department of Physics, and Sebastian Streichen in the Department of Physics. And I also thank my collaborators and, and the funding that, that allows this science to happen. So thank you for your time.